Raf Giallo here from Team 33 and delighted to be joined by Stephen Scragg, the author of A Tournament Frozen in Time, The Wonderful Randomness of the European Cup Winners' Cup. This, um, as you said, is A Tournament Frozen in Time, which uh, is the obviously the title. Um, it's been kind of long forgotten. It's 20 years actually since it disappeared. And uh, maybe just to even jump straight into the book, you put a lot of store in the 80, 81 edition of the tournament. Um, it's the cover of the book. There's a whole chapter dedicated to it. What was it about 80, 81 that encapsulated this particular tournament? I'd probably just say it was the most outlandish of all the seasons. It, I mean, it was an outlandish tournament from start to finish anyway, but 1980, 81 was just the, the season that encapsulated that more than anyone else. And uh, to, to have an all Eastern European final played in a sparsely populated stadium on the western side of Berlin. And, and it was it was just such a fantastic, fantastic sorry, Dusseldorf actually that final. Um it, but it, it was it was an amazing year. I mean you, to to have kind of like Castilla, the the Real Madrid reserve side involved. West Ham United were playing from the second division. You know, Newport County reached the quarterfinals and and just it just suspended belief. Everything that, that went was it was just one outlandish incident after another. And was this a tournament that teams generally took seriously? Because we know anything that isn't really nowadays Premier League or Champions League, even group stages sometimes, they don't really take them seriously. And I would imagine back in the day it was completely different in that sense. Well, it was. I think, I think all three major European tournaments back then were, were taken massively seriously. I mean, we aren't talking now where European games, European club competitions are are happening, you know, a couple of times a month. You know, with the, with the group stage of the Champions League, we go deep into December. Then the the knockout stages tend to start from I don't know around about mid February. So there's very little in the way of breaks. And and with the old style of European competitions, you got two rounds before Christmas, three with the UEFA Cup, and then it started again in March. So these games were just like massive oasises of, of just kind of like hipster joy, basically. So yeah, all three tournaments were taken very, very seriously. Yeah, uh, you know, a lot of the domestic cup competitions across Europe weren't taken seriously. Yeah, but the, this 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 dangling carrot of the Cup Winners' Cup was was very attractive to a lot of teams in a lot of countries. And especially it was quite influential on a lot of actual associations to set up their own um, cups, as you mentioned in the book. Like Hungary, I didn't realise they'd never really, well, they had kind of versions of what you might call a cup, but not an official one, as you maybe call it overall, like a Hungarian FA Cup. So the Cup Winners' Cup actually, in a way, spurred a few nations to uh, to go down that route. It did. The, 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 like Hungary's the prime example there. Uh, you know, I think there was a three-year gap between the domestic tournament being played. There was one year where it took three years to to complete the the loop of the tournament, and it did regenerate a lot of domestic club competitions, cup competitions across Europe. But it, it also saved a few. You know, the, there was there wasn't a, a Czechoslovak Cup, for instance. There were Slovak and, and Czech individual tournaments but even then they were they were almost like friendly tournaments and then eventually these tournaments were brought together to to bring a Czechoslovak cup into into operation and I think now I mean you, you only have to look at I mean a, a lot of people turn around and say that things like the Copa del Rey and the the Copa Italia aren't really taken all that seriously but they are a lot lot more serious than they used to you only have to look at, at Valencia last season and and the the celebrations on the streets of Valencia and winning the Copa del Rey and, and I think that's probably the greatest legacy the Cup Winners' Cup can offer is that it, it regenerated and saved and, and breathed life into these domestic cup competitions that might have fallen by the wayside. Yeah, and unlike the European Cup, like obviously the European Cup, um, there were the Eastern Euro the best of the Eastern European teams would emerge, but maybe, uh, actually when you look back historically, not many of them reached finals until later on where we see Steyr Bucharest and Red Star Belgrade. But in the Cup Winners' Cup, particularly teams from East Germany, which was in a in the football sense quite weak in comparison to the West. We were seeing teams like Magdeburg, which uh, was obviously the same year that uh, the East Germans beat the West Germans in a in a World Cup uh, tournament. Well, that was it. It was it was East Germany's one major success. You know, 1974 Magdeburg beating AC Milan in the final as well. Uh, Rotterdam again, another sparsely populated stadium. And, uh, but I mean, you'd, you'd think that is a derogatory thing, but I think there was almost like a little, there was, there was a charm of its own to see these games rattling around uh, on almost empty stadium. And uh, there was something quite evocative about them. But 
for an East German side to win it in 74, no better year to do it, to, like you say, go into the World Cup finals and beat in West Germany there. It was a fine international side that they had as well then. And, uh, and Jürgen Sparwasser was, was so integral to both of those successes. Yeah, and then obviously there's the 1980s then, and there's Lobanovsky and, uh, with uh, Dinamo Kiev, who went on to have success in the Champions League once that uh, launched in its early years. But uh, this was a particularly um, avant-garde team. Yeah, they were fantastic. I mean, the, the great thing about uh, Dinamo Kiev is that those two successes uh, are split by a decade. And that the, uh, the games were just so emblematic as well, because in 75, it was Ferenc Varos, so it was an all-Eastern block final. And then to, to turn around and defeat Atletico, Atletico Madrid so convincingly in 86. And the fact that it was Lobanowski at the helm on both occasions and that Oleg Blocking was the, the, the you know, one of the guiding forces on the pitch, you know, in ageing in 86, but still effective. And in 75, you know, he was one of the best players in Europe by far. And, and yeah, they, they were great. And, and there, were, there were other instances, Slovan Bratislava in, in 69, who defeated Bayern Munich, uh, sorry, Barcelona. And, uh, and then into the 80s, Carl Zischiener from Eastern, uh, East uh, Germany reached the final, as did Lokomotiv uh, Leipzig later in the, in the decade. Yeah, and uh, obviously in English football terms, Liverpool are the aristocrats in Europe, but um, funnily enough, they reached one final, never won, this is the one kind of, this is the one trophy in Europe they never won. Um, and obviously it's, there's more of a love affair, I guess, from the other clubs, from Man United, Tottenham, West Ham, who all went into this and uh, enjoyed some success. Yeah, I mean, as a, as a Liverpool fan, that was, it was the one that we didn't win. So you know, it, it's it's the black mark on the on, on the honours list that we we missed out on. Uh, but it, it, for me, that was it. As a, as a Liverpool fan growing up, there was great fear in the European Cup. I I grew up with Liverpool playing in the European Cup year in year out. And there was great fear in kind of like losing in Europe. You wanted to win all the time. So as much as I loved the European Cup and loved watching Liverpool win it, there was a great fear every time we we took part in it. But uh, for for kind of like the the Cup Winners Cup, it felt like it didn't have that that fear factor. And for me, it was probably the the breeding ground for me in, in being a, a general football lover as well as a Liverpool supporter. You know, you could enjoy these stories and these games and these finals and these bizarre tangents that it always used to go off on and and, and not have that fear factor of your own team being involved yeah. but uh, yeah a lot of a lot of british sides did so well i mean i, I very much remember kind of like aberdeen winning in 83 and and, and really being convincing in beating real madrid and gothenburg as well yeah. but yeah english teams everton 85 the finest moments and uh, Spurs in '63. It was it was the first English side to win, first British side to win a major European competition. Yeah. Uh, and then it was it was huge for Alex Ferguson, not just in, in with Aberdeen, but to to win it with Manchester United in '91 it was probably the biggest springboard for them in becoming the team that they did for the rest of the decade. Yeah, you mentioned Everton there, interestingly enough, because they're you know they've they've enjoyed peaks and troughs over the last hundred fifty years or whatever, however long they've been around. Um, Europe is kind of the thing that they never really enjoyed success in, and they peaked probably at the wrong time in the eighties. So they win the Cup Winners' Cup, and then obviously there's the ban um, following what happened in Hazel. Um, would the eighty four eighty five Cup Winners' Cup would that have been any guide into so much as like what they might have achieved had they been able to play in the European Cup the following season? I think to toss of a coin for me. I mean, I, I spoke to Everton. I was at pains to get the Everton part of the book right. Being a Liverpool fan, you know, I mean, I, I respect Everton Football Club for their achievements and the history that they've got. I'm not a Liverpool fan that's you know militants against our neighbours over the over the park, but. Yeah, I think that Everton side in 86, had they gone into the European Cup, it would have been one extreme or the other. They didn't really have a European pedigree before 84, 85. And and, and even going back into Europe post Heysel, they've never really kind of like achieved, you know, was that 84, 85 one spike that was going to stand the test of time or, or could it have been something bigger? It was a great side and they could have done. Now, interestingly, they went into the draw for the 85, 85, 85, 86 European Cup and they did faced Andalet, who themselves were, were A, a very good side, but also B, open to subterfuge. You know, you don't have to look at the 83, 84 semi-final against Nottingham Forest, for instance, where, you know, a, a bribery has been admitted by the club and it was that era. 
So, you know, Everton might have found it difficult to get past Anderlecht in the first round of that European Cup, but they might well have got past that. For me, it was it was all or nothing. They'd, they'd have fallen very early or they'd gone very, very close. But if, if they'd have played Anderlecht, if they'd have followed the path that Anderlecht have had in 84 85, they'd eventually pass by in Munich as well along the way. So it... If they'd have won the European Cup in '86, they'd have they'd have done it the hard way, and they'd have they'd have deserved it. Yeah, uh, Barcelona obviously have won the most Cup winners' Cup, but it, it came at a time when they weren't succeeding in the European Cup. Obviously, 1992 is the when Cruyff's dream team won it is the first, and then obviously since then they've really established themselves as a super club. Did the Cup winners' Cup wins? Did they kind of mitigate or even lay, um, you know, lay to waste? I suppose the ghosts of the past in that period, or you know, was it something at least that um, gave them a bit of impetus in that period where they were watching Real Madrid win uh, multiple, multiple kind of European trophies? I mean, the most elite one, as in the European Cup. Was it something that um, that kind of garlanded what they were doing? Yeah, I, th- I think the, the Cup Winners Cup was the proudest thing at that era. They won the the the, the Liga title. I think it was 60, 61 or fifty nine, sixty, and then between then and Terry Venables winning it in eighty four, eighty five, they only won it once, and that was you know with Cruyff on the pitch and Michels on the touchline in seventy three, seventy four. They found it very difficult to win uh, the Liga title, and you know historically they will point to the Franco era and they will say that they were robbed of a few titles but there was also a great lack of consistency in Barcelona of that era they could go out and beat Real Madrid one week and then lose to a Real Betis or a Burgos the following week so Path to me doesn't buy into the the fact that they were kind of like under the thumb somewhere you know I think they could have they, 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 they were the master of their own downfall in that respect for my money. But that Cup Winners' Cup was such a massive refuge for them in that respect. They won the Copa del Rey or the Copa del Rissimo as it was before that for a period of time. And uh, and the Cup Winners' Cup just, it, it, it was a, a great thing for them you know, to win it four times, to reach a further two finals. And uh, and, it, and Barcelona were the Cup Winners' Cup for a very, very long time. And, and even down to the latter years when they won it in 97 with that great side that had Ronaldo in it and Luis Figo and, and Bobby Robson at the helm. You know, uh, for me, you know, when push comes to show, Barcelona are the Cup Winners' Cup. Yeah, and interesting enough, um, obviously it came at a crucial time where Cruyff is still, at least the uh, the, the late 80s win, um, it comes at a time where Cruyff is building this dream team, it's at the very beginning of it, kind of like, as you mentioned, Manchester United, it was an important springboard for them. Interestingly, they beat Sampdoria in one of the fi- in that final, and yeah, they, meet 80, again, 80, yeah, they meet again in the European Cup final. Yeah, three years later. Yeah. Yeah. So was it often a and, sp- and quite, was it often a springboard for uh, for clubs um, in that sense where they they win that it's an important trophy, it's an import, important building block, and then they take that into European Cup campaigns. It was it was in some respects, you know, as we say, Ferguson. It was huge for Ferguson. Yeah, it was eight years between winning the Cup Winners' Cup and that 1999 Champions League. But certainly domestically and becoming the dominant force, that was huge for them. You can point to, say, AC Milan, who won in 68, and they won the European Cup the following year. And, uh, and yeah, Barcelona in 89, it was massive because when Cruyff had taken over, Real Madrid was still the dominant domestic force. So to be able to put a, a trophy of purpose in the Barcelona boardroom and then to build on that, you know, within two years of winning the Cup Winners Cup in 89, the wrestling the lead title away from Real Madrid and they go off on their own four season span of, of, of winning it. And then that, 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 that elusive European Cup comes in 92, yeah. reaching another final in 94, that epic final that they lost to, to Milan. So yeah, 89 was absolutely massive to Barcelona. Yeah, and uh, there's an interesting trend as well, as you point out in the book. Um, no team ever retains the Cup Winners' Cup. Obviously, it's the nature of a knockout competition that you're qualifying from uh, through your own um, knockout domestic competition. And even if you do get uh, put into the tournament because you've won the trophy, um, there just seems to be this trend where nobody nobody seemed to be able to make that step that we've seen in the European Cup uh, and Champions League multiple times. Yeah, it was a, a, one of the big peculiarities of the tournament. Seven teams won it and then got back to the the following season's final uh, just to fall short. You know, Arsenal were one of those in '95 when they'd won in '94. That uh, indelible kind of naive goal for Real Zaragoza, 
And uh, and yeah, I think it was one of the great quirks. You know, can look at Anderlet, who was so dominant in the tournament in the late seventies, winning it seventy six. Went back to the final in seventy seven and lost it, but then went back again in seventy eight and won it. So you know they were another team that that benefited massively through the Cup Winners Cup, and uh, and yeah, it was it was it was one of the great oddities of the tournament was was that none of the holders managed to go back and win it despite getting to the final. Yeah, and uh, there's another interesting trend as well. So we we've seen Wenger, Arsene Wenger, in his time at Arsenal, losing a UEFA Cup final and a Champions League final, and we know what he's achieved domestically. But he also lost a Cup Winners Cup final, as you mentioned, in 1992 against Werder Bremen. It's an, again yep. another interesting kind of trend in his career. But also the French clubs, um, like the European Cup and actually most European trophies, they tend to underachieve, other than say PSG in the 90s. They do. It's it's a, a mad a mad set of events for the French teams, you know. Because you can go back to the seventies and and how good Saint Etienne were, you know, along with Bruce Munch and Gladbach, probably the best two sides not to win a European Cup. You know, Stad Reims reached two European Cup finals in the very early years in the late fifties, and and there just seems to be no 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 reason for it other than I don't know, almost like a, a conspiracy of fate, almost. But yeah, that, it was it was huge that PSG won it, and and it, it is one of those great oddities again that it still remains PSG's only major European trophy, despite the the financial advantages that they the current the contemporary version of them have. Yeah, and uh, funnily enough, to mention a French team, Saint Etienne. Um, I remember we did an interview on this show before with David Fairclough, the Liverpool legend, kind of super sub was the name of the book at the time. Um, they and he obviously played a key role when Liverpool beat them in the European Cup uh, quarter final, famous comeback. Same night as you mentioned in the book, uh, Southampton are playing Anderlecht. So. Uh, in the Cup Winners' Cup. So these yep. competitions were able to kind of coexist on the same nights. I presume that's obviously the effect of TV, which comes in later on. It's not as apparent um, in that time. Yeah, they, they just ran in conjunction with each other. I mean, you, you did get the occasional game that was on a, on a different night. Sometimes there'd be, you know, just just the logistics of it. I think I think it was more a case of fixtures being arranged between teams rather than being dictated to by UEFA or television. So, you know, if, if a fixture did suit a, a Tuesday or a Thursday night, then it was down to the two clubs to agree that. But mostly, they all just took place at the same time. And that was, you know, one of the, the great things about growing up in the as a child of the 70s and the 80s was watching sports night and, and midweek sports special and, and you know, either avoiding the score or knowing the score because you've, you've heard the games on the radio and then watching the footage later on in the evening. But yeah, that Southampton game on the same night as the Liverpool Saint Etienne game, it's it's one of those great uh, one of those great games that has gone forgotten. Yeah, and um, I just noticed uh, through the book when you're talking about some of the finals, um, the attendances were quite low um, in some cases, but particularly, I guess, where the Eastern European teams have got to the final more so. Um, was that a general trend or was it just uh, in the case of teams from behind the Iron Curtain? Um, obviously, their fans wouldn't travel in as big numbers. Yeah, I mean, it, it did happen from time to time. I mean, the fact that you've got kind of like AC Milan involved in like the 74 final, and there's only... There's less than seven thousand in in De Kuyp and Rotterdam. You know, there, there should be more Italian fans there. You would have you would have expected. So you know, the fact that it's Magdeburg shouldn't have the attendance so low. But you know, I think it's the '64 final where there's only about three and a half thousand, which is the lowest attendance for a major European final ever. And it was an amazing game that ended three all, went one way, then the other, and and the replay had a you know a, a bigger attendance, but only oh, still only about twelve thousand. Uh, for for a game that was settled by a goal scored directly from a corner kick, but again, it's just those utterly random kind of generators of of the tournament that made it so special. But yeah, it, it could be that there was no rhyme or reason sometimes why attendances would be so low. You know, uh, cheaper travel, of course, has made it easier for us now. You know, it wasn't the case back then. You know, you didn't have the internet where you could just jump on and and, and book your flights and. It was more of a logistical issue to 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 do your football and travel back then than it is now. Yeah, 
Um, obviously, it's 20 years now since the tournament disappeared, Lazio being the uh, the last winners, and I, I don't remember the Cup Winners' Cup final, I just remember the Super Cup where they beat uh, Manchester United, and obviously Marcelo Salas, uh, the Chilean um, striker, doing um, quite well. But um, obviously, the the decline had must have set in long before that, and obviously the Champions League is expansion is one, is one key reason. But when did the decline really start, and I suppose lead to that disappearance? into the Cup Winners' Cup? I'd probably say it coincides with the with the Champions League. You know, that, that extended invitation to more teams than just the your league champions. You know, 97, 98, I think, was the first season where multiple teams were allowed in from certain leagues. And then that just grew and expanded. And then uh, it, 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 when you get into a case of kind of like 80, 98, 99, where... I think it was the Dutch sides where not even the runner-up went into the Cup Winners' Cup. It was a beaten semi-finalist because the two finalists of the, the KMVB Cup in 98 had finished in the Champions League berth. So they went into the Champions League and the two beaten semi-finalists uh, had effectively another Cup final to play off for the for the Cup Winners' Cup spot. So, you know, when you've got that happening, then you know it's kind of, it's, it's reached the end of the line somewhat. And, and as sad as it is, you know, it was a tournament of its time that was still being competed for in a in a new age environment, basically. Yeah, so there's no hope for a revival in even the the smallest sense. I would, I would gather. I can't I can't see it. I'd love it to happen, but you know, this 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 new third UEFA tournament that's taking place. There was a golden opportunity for UEFA to say, look, we'll give you at least in a test a test run. You know, a European tournament as it used to be. Two-legged games, no group stages, and uh, an entry via, I don't know, maybe a domestic cup or, or at least some kind of end-of-season playoff to, to reach that tournament. Yeah, maybe a Champions League spot, because that seems to be the only thing that acts as a carrot now for modern clubs, or at least not the super clubs. They can possibly even survive a few years outside the Champions League. But if you were to say, say, a Wigan Athletic wins the FA Cup a few years ago, and they have the carrot of a Champions League through the... Uh, to a kind of cup winners cup style tournament that would have that possibly would have been huge rather than having this third tournament which nobody's going to watch. Yeah, I I I'd fully agree with that. You know, make make it make it a you know a massive prize and, and your domestic cup competition will uh, will certainly be regenerated. Yeah, and I suppose before I let you go, um, if you were to pick a final from all the Cup Winners' Cups uh, from the early 60s up to the last one um, that Lazio were involved in, which one, which one's your favourite to look back on or which one was the most enjoyable to, to research and maybe which one had more nuggets uh, of information that maybe just came to light as you, as you kind of did the research for the book? Uh, that, that, that 64 final kind of like was, I found really interesting. You know, for me, it was just a score line in a, in a, in a textbook. Uh, so sporting and against MTK of, of Budapest, the fact that you know they were the only sporting were the only Portuguese side to win the tournament. So you know, bigger bigger lights in the in the face of kind of like Benfica and, and Porto, it evaded them. So you know, it's a, it's a proud thing for sporting to be the only Portuguese side to have won the tournament. And, and the fact that it was such a, a an epic final as well, three all, it went to a replay. You know, the finals won by a, a goal scored directly from a corner, and uh, it just seemed to have absolutely everything. And and I think it was was it MTK who, who had overcome Celtic. I think it was in the semi finals as well. And and even that had a you know a, a very impressive comeback from it was three and all down to win the second leg four nil and. You know, a team that were, were out of it and, and completely disregarded to come so close to glory in it. And uh, and yeah, that's I think that was my final, favourite final in, in terms of researching. Yeah. You know, a final that I watched. I have to go back to that Aberdeen Real Madrid final because it was on such a rainy night in Gothenburg. And, you know, uh, and Aberdeen were just fantastic that night against a, a very good Real Madrid side that was led by Alfredo de Stefano. Yeah, was it as big a shock, that one actually, just interestingly? Or I, I know in the book you kind of detail there were a few a, a few circumstances that would have been in Aberdeen's favour in terms of the pitch conditions, etc. But... Yeah, the pitch conditions, the temperature, you know, playing in Northern Europe, you know, the, the, it, was, it was basically in a, a game being played south of Scotland. So for Real Madrid to travel from the warmth of the south to the far north of Europe, the rain, and uh, and yeah, I think there was there was less of a fear factor for Aberdeen. They were you know on top domestically. 
they could have won virtually everything like that season and they were a great, great side, but they also had a load of kind of like very young players in there. So you were looking at players who were late teens, early 20s, and I think there was just a complete lack of fear for Aberdeen in that in that final. Yeah. And uh, they were deserved winners as well. Yeah, and obviously the Alex Ferguson factor as well. So Stephen Scrag, uh, thanks a million for taking the time to chat to us. The book is A Tournament Frozen in Time, The Wonderful Randomness of the European Cup Winners' Cup. And thanks a million for coming on. Oh, no, thanks. Thank you for asking.